Hello, welcome to the Classical Top 5. I'm Tommy Pearson, and as ever, I'm here with Richard Bratby and Charlotte Gardner. What have you guys been up to musically this week? Charlotte, what have you been doing? Well, lots of CD reviews again, and ah. feature writing as well. But actually, I was interesting, and um, I was reviewing a really interesting one last night. Um, Alexandra Kononova, um, the violinist, Moldovian violinist, she's um, released Vivaldi Four Seasons. And it's one of these lockdown recordings, or not quite lockdown, <laughs> but she, during the spring lockdown, was playing the Four Seasons to her neighbours from her balcony and decided, right, I'm just going to record it. And so it is a proper studio-ish recording. It was um, recorded on location. And it's really, really good. And and there are things that are particularly interested in me. I mean, first of all, the fact that so much of the lockdown stuff that we've seen, I mean, Daniel Hope's Wonderful Hope at Home album, um, Ray Chen's Sonatas and Partitas, The Bark, there's been a definite sort of introvert hunkering down quality to all of it. And she's come along with the four seasons. I mean, it's literally all about life and forward facing. And it was really wonderful to listen to. And the other thing mm. that fascinated me about it was she didn't start with spring. Um, she started instead with autumn. And I'm still, actually, I'm not entirely convinced by that, but it was really interesting the way once you'd got over the discombobulation, it did make you listen to it in a different and fresher way. I think these are such well-recorded, over-recorded perhaps works then whether you agree with that sort of reordering or not, does at least make you think and hear things anew. Richard, what have you been up to? Well, it's, it's been a funny, funny sort of late November period. This is a time of year when normally people would be hastily commissioning programme notes and things like that for Christmas concerts. And yes. then particularly in, in rapid succession after that, when they suddenly realise that they can't clock off yet, uh, the Viennese concerts in the new year. And these, I don't know, fingers crossed, such, well, I hope someone put something together. But very, very little of that seems to be happening this year. The CDs are still coming though, like Charlotte says. And um, yeah, a um, couple of couple of what you might call dream commissions I've had for reviewing in the last week. Um, um, a set of symphonies by Franz Schmidt, um, recorded by Pavo Jervi in the Hamburg um, Hamburg Orchestra, Hamburg Frankfurt. Sorry, um, and and yeah, I mean the ultimate and the, the ultimate dream dream review, um, the one we, we're all secretly hoping we're going to have to do, which was the Jonas Christmas album, the Jonas Kaufman Christmas album. And that is, I mean, it writes itself. Christ, I mean, wow. <laughs> Where does one even start? I mean, eight hundred words is not enough, really, to do that. <laughs> Isn't it? I can, I can, I can do it in one if you like. <laughs> I've, I've given it my best shot, and um, you know, all there uh, in your soon to hit the bookshelves, um, super soar away Christmas double edition of the Spectator. You can find out precisely um, what I had to say about Jonas Kaufman singing Mariah Carey's. All I want for Christmas is you, which I, 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 I'm going to go on the limb and say this is one for the ages. We're going to be listening to this in 20 years' time, <laughs> and it's still going to be as astonishing, as incredible, as as right. as compulsively listenable <laughs> as it is today. I mean, how many can say that? Take take your word for that. Um, <laughs> and by the by the way, just mentioning in my experience, uh, you get to be asked to do a huge amount of uh, Christmas material for the concerts, um, program notes, and stuff really 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 last minute as always for concerts that were planned about 18 months ago that's right isn't it yeah. well that's, that's a given what, i think i think tends that's, to happen <laughs> tends to be how the industry works yes yeah, yes yeah, so yeah. But this thing we've had um I, I was asked three days notice to um write something for bbc radio 3 about an anniversary that um could have been anticipated 100 years ago that's just <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah i'm sorry i was just gonna say it reminds me of uh flying back for you know a long haul flight of maybe 12 hours to heathrow and when you arrive at heathrow they're not ready for you with the with the steps and everything and you think well at what point in the last 12 hours were you not expecting us uh, it it feels like that you know there's an inevitability about our arrival that's been going on for at least 12 hours and still you're not ready for us it feels Concert, concert program note writing could sometimes feel a bit like that. Sorry, Charlotte. No, I was just going to say, I'm actually feeling a little bit relieved to have not had the concert pro, the Christmas program note commissions this year. It was interesting. Yeah, okay. I Normally, I'm a real Christmas fairy when it comes to the 1st of December. The Christmas music goes straight on. And, and this year, I mean, I did it. 1st of December, the first music that I put on when I got into my office yesterday morning was Silent Night. And I sat there listening and thought, do you know what? I'm not ready for this yet. And I've never felt that way at Christmas. Mm -hmm. Christmas before, Christmas before, Christmas before. 
the, the, the other gardeners I think are going to be incredibly thankful for this because I drive them crazy <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to put any Christmas music on for at least another week I'd say I'm, I'm quite not quite sure what's happened there well I, I was thinking of um uh, of doing it when, when it's Christmas uh, but I'm old fashioned that way. Uh, I, I, I... <laughs> but that starts on 23rd of December for you, doesn't it? It certainly does. Uh, that's almost Scrooge like. It's, it's ne- no, no, no. It's about enjoying Christmas at Christmas. That's all it is. Anyway, uh, right. Come on, let's get on well, with our uh, with our podcast t- today and uh, our subject, <laughs> which was the winner of our Twitter poll asking uh, which top five our listeners would like to hear the most. Uh, And it's the top five orchestral solos. So that is solos for instruments from within the orchestra as opposed to concertos. Uh, It's another huge subject. You've been making your own suggestions as always. Thank you so much for all of them. I'll try and mention as many of them as possible as we uh, go along. I wonder how we all got on with this because uh, I know all three of us have played in orchestras and perhaps done solos uh, ourselves, perhaps me slightly less than the other two because of being a percussionist uh, and it's just one of those default settings. Um, But uh, a fascinating subject. Uh, It was one actually that uh, we should give due credit to Charlotte for this one because uh, it was one of her subjects suggestions. And I think it's a terrific one, but my goodness, it is a huge subject because there are so many. I made the decision to ignore the ones uh, that actually many of which were, uh, that we mentioned in the openings, uh, top five openings. So um, ones like the flute at the beginning of La Midi or the clarinet at the beginning of Rhapsody in Blue or the trumpet at the beginning of Marla Five. I I decided to sort of go for ones that were more folded into the the piece, if you like, more folded into the action that came out, sort of organically came out of the piece rather than sort of started in that in that very stark way that so many pieces do with with a solo instrument. Um, But let's go. Let's let's dive straight in and let's start with you, Richard. What's your first? Um, Well, I I think um, this is a cellist in me speaking, but I thought um, I'd begin not with just one solo, but a sextet of solos. Um, And it's the beginning of the William Tell Overture by Rossini. Um, And Rossini gets such a bad rap, doesn't he? I've seen him described as the laziest composer in history. They say he wrote (laughs) to a formula. Um, You know, his overtures are cleverly done, but all basically following the same pattern. And and, I mean, none of this can withstand an encounter with the opera William Tell. Um, Of course, most of us don't encounter the opera, uh, which is a tremendous piece. You know, it's um, opulent in its scale, you know, huge in its ambition and emotional scope. but most of us just know the overture, don't we? And most of us, let's be honest, just know the last three minutes of the overture, the gallop, which, and I've got to say, um, it's not a solo, that the first violin part in, in that is, is is like a concerto in its own right. You you watch the violins of an orchestra playing that, just playing some of that passage work and the look of relief on their faces as they sort of come off their finally major scale at <laughs> semi-quavers and the trumpets take over again. But no, I, I mean, the overture is an astonishing piece. I mean, it sort of takes the idea of the, the, the Italian operatic overture as a sinfonia, a symphony, and sort of creates this four movement symphonic poem years before the term was invented, um, beginning with this glorious portrayal of dawn for six cellos. Um, and right at the beginning, it's just one cello. Um, that cello just starts. Um, it's a terrifically written little solo. I mean, it just lies beautifully under the hand. I used to pr- use this as a sort of warm-up phrase in my own my own playing days. Um, down on the two string, rises up like the sun rising, and then this lush, sonorous, sweet chorale for the sort of six cellos, depicting basically the rising sun in this sort of graceful, shapely, very operatic. Um, an utterly unforgettable way. I mean, the sound of the cellos in close harmony um, is so rich, so warm. I mean, yeah. it's, it's one of the great chocolatey, creamy experiences of classical music, hearing, hearing a cello ensemble. Yeah. And, and that's what he, he did. I mean, I mean, there's a story that may be apocryphal, but when Carian was sort of trying out for one of his early conducting jobs, um, he was in competition with various other conductors, and they're all sort of playing their Beethoven fifths, what have you, your Brahms ones, that sort of thing. He apparently sent away the entire orchestra, um, apart from the cello section, and his allotted rehearsal time spent the entire hour of rehearsal just rehearsing the cello section in that extraordinary 
ensemble solo opening um, and showing what he could do with that. And the story goes, he got the job. I, I don't know. <laughs> this sounds to me like a, a real apocryphal story. Yes. <laughs> it, 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 there's so much music in, the, in yeah. that, that, that opening. Um, it's such an imaginative use of tone colour. I mean, this is, um, what are we talking about, 18, 1820s, early, mid to late 1820s. Um, we've had the revolution of Weber, and Berlioz and Beethoven at this point, but still the idea of orchestral colour is a fairly original one, especially in yeah. the world of Italian opera, where, you know, I mean, it's, uh, this is a horrible stereotype, but it tends to be back then about um, you get the melody out and you have something chugging away underneath it, um, repeat ad infinitum with, with trills. Um, and there it is. It's just this gorgeous bit of tone colour, this gorgeous bit of writing, and beginning with the cello solo that actually, it's much easier to play than it sounds, but it can't help but make an effect. There's, there's no question that uh, a lot of the suggestions made on social media uh, are um, clips taken, uh, are, are featuring instruments that are played by the person that suggested it. Um, so for, <laughs> so for example, so you've done a cello one because you, you play the cello, Richard. I mean, Julian Lloyd Webber, a uh, previous um, guest on this show, uh, or he, he put up two suggestions for us, uh, the cello solo just before the end of Shostakovich's first symphony and the cello solo in the slow movement of Brahms's second piano concerto. And I, I think that's quite, uh, quite common here. Uh, a lot of people, I mean, I, I, know, I know I'm going to do it. And I, I wonder, uh, uh, with my own instrument, I wonder whether Charlotte's going to choose one with her instrument, Charlotte? Well, actually, I'm not sure that I really am. Now, no. I, I made myself a few rules as well. It was funny, the moment, <laughs> you know, I suggested this topic. And then I just realized what an absolute bottomless pit of possibilities it yeah. is. I mean, where on earth do you start? Um, <laughs> and so what I decided, um, the rules that I laid down for myself were that I wanted to have a few that were just Bible and Shakespeare beer choices that you had to have in there and a few more left field ones. And then also I've just ruled out anything where the solo, the orchestral solo is engaging with the soloist, yeah. concerto soloist at the same time. Um, which I felt was sensible, which was kind of painful in a way, because one thing that I didn't get out last week, I think that one of the most genius moments of solo instrument in orchestral work is in Vorjak's cello concerto, when the cello engages with a flute of, mm. all, um, of all instruments. And you think this was, cello concertos were just not a thing. He'd been persuaded to write it by hearing a um, concerto by Victor Herbert. And um, I don't, the, the flute and the cherry thing, that must have come entirely from him. It was genius, but where the hell did he get it from? Um, so actually I've skipped that in now, haven't I? But no, my first choice is an instrument that I have never played before. But I was, the, the other thing that I was thinking of, I wanted solos that I didn't just love for their sound, where I didn't just admire the writing but also the solos where I'm just absolutely overcome with respect for the poor salt who has to play them. Yeah. And Flautus ranked very, very high on that list. I mean, Debussy, the, the prelude de la Comédie d'Antoine, I mean, that has to rank in the top three, doesn't it? But the other one for me, uh, especially after Gareth telling us all about the real experience of doing it the other week, yeah. Um, yeah. but my absolute top overall spot has to go to the snare drama in Bolero. <laughs> now, I, I just don't know how they do this. The same rhythmic figure over and over again for 15 minutes. There's nowhere to hide. The snare drum cuts through absolutely everything. If you screw up, you are toast. You ruin the whole effect. And, and just everything about it. First of all, you've got this opening, which is just you and pizzicato violas and cellos, and it's pianissimo. So first thing you have to do is just not come in too loud. And then you've got the, the challenge of main, of working your crescendo, you're playing nonstop for 15 minutes, starting pianissimo, ending fortissimo, and you have to measure that out over the entire time. And, and then I, if I were doing it myself, the thing that I would be most terrified of beyond my hands actually dropping off is my mind drifting for a couple of seconds and just forgetting whether which beat of the, the rhythmic figure I was on. One of the things that I've been doing in lockdown is skipping and my mind wanders. I have this thing that the first thing I do in the morning is I go and I skip 400 and, and then I come back and I do 200 and 200. I'm a little bit OCD about it, to be honest. But every single morning, round about the 300 mark, I'm suddenly thinking, oh my gosh, I've been daydreaming. I don't know whether I'm in the 300s or the 200s right now. And I'm doing, I measure it in the end by how physically tired I am. But that's just me skipping. I can just imagine being that poor snare drummer and thinking, 
I, I don't know which half of the bar I was because suddenly I wondered whether I'd left the hair straighteners on um, when I left the house to come to the concert. Um, so yeah, it, it's that. And, and just what if you get an itch as well? There's nothing you can do about it. Um, <laughs> and then even more terrifying, the, the penultimate bar, everybody's fortissimo. You're competing now with a whole orchestra. You've got to hammer this thing out and then you've got to rest. Um, you have to stop with the rest of the orchestra. If you, if you don't know where you are at that point, again, you're toast and you've got a beat and a half and then you all have to come in on exactly the right point again. And, and then if, if that weren't all bad enough, the trombonist has what must be the sexiest, most loose trombone solo perhaps in the history of orchestral writing. I'd also be stood there with a snare drum feeling really, really jealous. Well, l lots and lots to pick up on there, Charlotte, as a percussionist. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, one is, I don't think it's a solo at all. It's an accompaniment, of course, throughout. It's just a sustained no. accompaniment throughout. And, it, and, and at no point does it play on its own, of course, at no point in the piece. No, so it doesn't, it, but it's there. And of course, but it is the, it's the rhythmic backbone of the piece. I mean, everybody else, you could argue that pretty much everyone else gets a solo except the snare drum, who is just there to sustain that rhythm. The other thing is, if you're a snare drum, if you're a percussionist of any note, note at all, it's not a difficult thing to do. Uh, you get into a groove, essentially, and you s stay there. <laughs> uh, as, as for not knowing where you are, it's, it's the easiest uh, part in the, in the whole work to know where you are, because as you say, oh, you start and then you finish in a very, very obvious place. I mean, there's, it's the greatest key change in all music. And if you haven't noticed that while you're playing, uh, uh, and, and, <laughs> and that your and your ending is coming up, then you're not listening. That's 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 the, the other thing about it. Um, whereas, if you're the timpanist, for example, as I've, I've played timpani in this piece many many times as well, and actually I much prefer it. It's a fantastic part because it's just boom, boom, all almost all the way through, uh, <laughs> and you you get to be the kind of engine of it. Lovely, um, but um, uh, if you don't, it, the part doesn't have all the bars written out, uh, the, bar, the bars rest written out. It just says, tasset until, and then it very helpfully shows you the tune played. However, the tune of course is played many, many times by lots of different people and you, you just have to, and, and it's, such a it's such a famous piece, really. If it's the first time you've played it, then you can be a bit frightening, but really it's such a famous piece. You do, you took, you, you get to know where, where, when, when you're coming in at the timpanist, but as a snare drum player, you don't have to worry about that. You start it, you know, and you go all the way through. So uh, it's not difficult technically. Uh, I agree about the itching, um, but uh, also don't forget that a, a second snare drum player comes in uh, towards the end as well to create that sense of mm -hmm. getting louder and louder as well. The the whole, the idea of getting of of pacing yourself through with the with the with the big long piece long crescendo is one that I mean it's the same as a marathon runner or anybody else you just you just work it out you feel it you feel it and and of course the the piece is so well written in that regard for getting louder as it goes along anyway that you you just as long as you're listening to the ensemble you feel it so I wouldn't worry I wouldn't feel too sorry for the snare drum player in Bolero and also of course <laughs> it's of course you know all percussionists want the attention and they get the attention with this one um and you know so rarely do in other pieces it's um i think it's one of those i think we'll probably talk about this a lot but it is one of those um uh, parts that everybody is looking out for they know it's coming don't they you see it in the program bolero mm -hmm. oh let's let's watch let's have all eyes on the snare drum player and i think even worse the trombonist because you know we all know it's coming that trombone solo how many performances amateur performances have i done of that piece where the trombonist has messed it up so much it's hard i mean never mind itching it's hard not to laugh uh, or, or at least giggle halfway through when they completely bugger up the high notes because of course it is a it's a really hard part that and it's so exposed yeah. as well so uh, anyway that's enough about uh, bolero I mean, it's a great choice but uh, funnily enough uh, on on facebook i had a, a conversation with michael seal uh, mentioned about the solos in bolero and i think we probably could have done a whole show on top five solos in bolero couldn't we uh, but yeah, uh, quite let's, easily. Let's expand it. But you don't think the snare drum? Come on, Richard. I do want to know from Richard. Do you think the snare drum is a soloist or not? Come on, back me up. Um, I, I, yeah, I think it's pretty unanswerable. The soloist. I mean, the, the way it's. I mean, if we're saying it's it's not playing on its own. I mean, we're not just going for other company solos, are we? Here, we're going to be no, no, of course not. Program if we do. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's what you're. It's uh, it's for sound. It's for sound that dominates at the start. You, it's about moments in the spotlight. The um, you know, it's for trumpet at the beginning of pictures of exhibition. It's um. 
you know, it's a clowness at the beginning of Raps in Blue. It is that. And I'm sure it's, you know, as I say, I don't know, my, my experience of orchestral playing is that the easy, repetitive, straightforward, no worries about this, I can do this in my sleep solo, is the one that slips away from your fingers when you least expect it and goes horribly, yeah. horribly wrong. And you have <laughs> no way of getting it back because you've never bothered to practice in that much detail <laughs> because you've never needed to, because it's never gone wrong before. That's mm. that's it, isn't it? It's like, what do I do now? This isn't supposed to yeah. happen. <laughs> it's not the fiendish and difficult passage that you've done until you can play it in your sleep. It's it's the bit that you never need to worry about that um, yeah. suddenly trips you up, vanishes. You get that feeling like yeah. you're tumbling, tumbling into the void. Um, well, I don't know that happened to the percussionist. I, I mean, I, I have to say, I, I I did think about the Bolero side drum and whether it was difficult, whether it was the endurance test it sounds. And I, I just kind of assumed that playing repetitive rhythmic stuff at great length is, is how percussionists get their jollies. No. I, 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 I've i I've never really understood the percussionist mentality. We're not, we're but really, really, really we're not talking about it heavy lifting. Sounds like a... <laughs> we're not talking about heavy lifting here. We're talking about playing a snare drum for 15 minutes. It's, <laughs> you know, when you but do... As when... a violinist, it's just not something that you get in any score. I mean, we've always got the really interesting stuff. So mm. to me, the idea of playing that same thing yeah, well, and of course, and, I mean, I mean, there, there, there is this. I don't know how to do it. There is this. I mean, this great idea that you know, Bolero is a great repetitive work. I mean, I I remember the first time I played it. There were not two bars alike in my part. The scoring is so astonishingly refined, so yeah. subtle. It's an absolute yeah. masterclass in orchestration. I can never ever understand sort of people who roll their eyes and sort of re regard Bolero as a piece of rubbish, a piece of trash, a bit of a joke. Because it's I popular, mean, is, Richard. It's popular. That's the obviously. That's the it's Obviously, popular. yes, that, that, that's the thing, of isn't course, it? Of course, I mean, it's possible yeah. for an orchestra to sleepwalk through it as well. Oh, God, isn't it just... Yeah. Well, unless, yeah. unless you're the first like, trombone. Um. Let's, let's not make it the top five uh, best solos in, in Bolero. Let, let's move on. However, I must admit, when I was thinking of ones I was choosing, I could definitely have done a top five solos featured in Shostakovich's Eighth Symphony. Um, because there are a few fabulous ones in there. I mean, uh, unusual instruments like piccolo gives the piccolo a, a tremendous moment of real stark emotion. And it's something that piccolos often don't, they don't really get. They get the, the, the trilly flowery stuff often, um, but they, Shostakovich gives, gives the piccolo one of his great tunes in, in eight and at, at a real key, uh, a moment as you're coming down from uh, the, these great heights of these huge swells of sound in in the eighth. I mean, I've, I've discussed it before, but it's still my favourite of Shostakovich's symphonies. The the solo within it that I'm going to pick, however, is the one that thrills me every time I hear it, and I cannot get enough of it. And I listen to it a thousand times a week, probably. Um, and it's the trumpet solo in the third movement, which is uh, the fast uh, movement which is just full of rhythm and as uh, you know it's in it's in four four but it's it's a fast four four da, 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 like that and um i'm quite picky about the recording uh i and i think i might have even mentioned this recording before as well there's an amazing recording and um, ravinsky is my favorite shostakovich conductor always will be and him with the uh, leningrad philharmonic in 1960 on a bbc recording which is available on bbc legends uh, and others now i think um uh, recording on cd uh, from the Royal Festival Hall has the uh, the trumpeter at that point, um, who is a, a legendary uh, a trumpeter playing this extraordinary sound. I mean, it's a it's it's a wide open sound, huge sound dominating the entire hall. And he plays it with such excitement. Uh, and his sort of protege, if you like, the, the who um, I don't know whether he took over the, that that principal job uh, in the Leningrad Philharmonic, but he's called Vladimir Kafelnikov. There's a, a great YouTube clip of him playing it. He looks very much like Stephen Fry. It's a bit weird. Um, so if you want to see Stephen Fry playing the trumpet solo with Mravinsky <laughs> conducting, uh, go onto YouTube and look for that. Again, this extraordinary wide open, almost brass band like sound. So thrilling. Um, Shostakovich really does know how to write solos with within orchestral music. And in fact, lots and lots of suggestions on, on uh, Twitter and Facebook were of Shostakovich symphonies because it, it's all over, it, isn't it? Really knows how to give it. And the other, the other one in, in eight, which is one I've mentioned before, is the Cor Anglais solo, um, which is long and expansive. And again, at an incredibly emotional moment. 
Um, but I think I'm going to I'm going to go with the trumpet solo in the third movement because it's just so thrilling. It's so exciting. It's one of his big boom ching, boom ching, boom ching moments uh, of many, many of those in his symphonies <laughs> and beyond uh, with Shostakovich. But it, yeah, as I say, absolutely thrilling. And it, the trouble with getting to know that recording so well is that when you hear it done and it's not quite like that, it can become incredibly underwhelming. And as is the case with so many of the solos we're going to talk about today, you know it's coming. You know, you, I sit there in whenever I hear Shostakovich, I'm wait, I'm almost waiting for that moment because it's my favourite moment in the piece. And so if it doesn't meet my absolute strict criteria i'm i'm devastated <laughs> and it's happened so many times i should perhaps give up on that one but uh, i highly recommend the leningrad phil uh, recording with with Mravinsky. it's so exciting so that's the one i'm going to pick from uh, from shostakovich richard another one from you um well this is actually a percussion instrument of sorts um after what i just said um i think well, it's a keyboard instrument, um, and it's um, it seems so obvious, but it just seems to me so surprising still. The the Celeste in the Nutcracker, oh, the yes. yeah. um, which is such a cliche now, so familiar, so absolutely universally known. It's been on adverts, it's been on ringtones, it's been everywhere. It's the the Celeste solo in the repertoire, and it's people tend to forget this. Actually, it was probably the first major Celeste solo in the repertoire. The instruments had only just been yeah. invented. And there's this fantastic little bit of correspondence that Tchaikovsky, having decided, I think he'd been in France, he'd heard it. It had been invented by uh, Monsieur Musset, I think it was, Musset, um, an instrument maker in Paris. Um, and it was originally called the Celeste Musset for that reason. Um, and, and Tchaikovsky wrote um, to an instrument dealer um, well, to, to, to the orchestra manager at the ballet, basically saying, you need to get in touch with Paris and you need to have specially imported one of these new instruments uh, called the Celeste Musset, and you must let no one know about it. Um, because I, you know, I don't want Glazunov or, 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 or Boris or Balakarev or someone finding out about it first, spoiling the surprise. He wants it to be the first time it had been heard in Russia. Um, and that, that was, of course, you know, that's the dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. It's the first yeah. time. And in that one little piece, he has sort of captured that soul of the instrument, the soul of that instrument, the essence of that instrument forever. No one has ever written... Um, a more famous or more effective Celeste solo. It's, I mean, it's such a, I mean, Celeste appears all over the repertoire, but I mean, the, you always think of that, that particular instance. And it, and it's not so much, I mean, it's, it's not just the sound of the Celeste, that incredible chiming, jangling, that magical glassy sound, which he's using to conjure this sort of fantastic image. Um, we call her the sugar plum fairy, but I don't think many people nowadays know what sugar plums are, do they? I mean, it's <laughs> <No>. <laughs> la fée draguée, it says in the um, in the score in the in the, in the French title as he gave it, and and, and, and isn't that the, the, the draguée fairy? Oh, draguées are those little shiny silver, hard, brilliant little little balls of sort of edible metal that you put on on cakes. I don't know. I used to have them when I was a kid. Any, anyway, um, there it is. That's that's a Celeste perfectly captured. And this melody that just mm. shows this instrument off, introduces it to the world so perfectly. But it's not just that. It's just a delicious, delicious accompaniment. Yeah. These sort of slowly moving strings, um, the sort of dusky tone of the core anglais just sort of setting off the sound of the Celeste. Uh, the clarinet just kind of snaking around in its bottom register. Everything perfectly gauged. Where's the by... bass clarinet? I think it's the bass clarinet. The contrast of the bass clarinet That's and the it. Celeste I think is the genius bit of scoring. It, it's for darkness. It's, it's like it's like a swing of, it's like a Fabergé jeweler has got mm. this fantastic little piece of enamel work and is setting it in this exquisite, um, perfectly chosen sort of uh, metal framework, uh, just designed to show it off this gem off to its to its, to its absolute perfection. And you know, I mean, you, you've absolutely in that in that one piece, there you are. He's captured the soul of that instrument forever. That is forever stamped on the Celeste, and the Celeste is forever stamped on. Dance the sugar from fairy, and I mean, it, and it, just three minutes of music in a ballet, a uh, divertissement, and and he does it. Tchaikovsky nails it again, like he always does. Um, Charlotte, one of the I think looking across all of the suggestions um, on Twitter and Facebook, I think I'm right in saying that probably the most mentioned instrument, solo wise, um, is the horn, the French horn. Um, <laughs> so many examples of that i'm going to pick one myself um as well have you got a french horn in any in your top five because there's so there's so not. many examples you haven't got one no i have an english horn oh okay horn. I know, fair enough 
Go on, give us your English yeah, horn. Yeah, you want me to go with my no. English horn? Well, no. it's one of the Bible and Shakespeare ones. It is the New World Symphony, <laughs> the slow movement. And it, it's just sublime, isn't it? Um, what on earth do you say about this? Um, I think what I really am overawed with in terms of it is, is just the fact that Borjak, first of all, made this melody, but then he chose the cor anglais for it. I mean, not, it doesn't work on any other instrument. It is such a famous famous tune that other mm -hmm. people try to steal it every now and then you know when you have crossover albums you know some often cellists they'll say oh I can play this it'll sound really nice on the cello and it doesn't it's kind of <laughs> um, you, you need that core anglais sort of earthiness to it I mean of course I mean it's why it works so well the core anglais works so well in Sibelius is swan to, to Anela as well there's a there's a sort of magical mist coming over the hills in the early morning um, quality to it, a primeval quality almost, but also this, this kind of silky elegance with it. And, and I think that no other instrument but the cor anglais could have played that solo um, for Borjak. And I, I think it's stunning. There's not really much more to say on the subject than that. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I assume someone would, uh, would choose it. I have to say, I think it's, uh, it's a dangerous, there's a, there's a, a danger with it. Um, and in fact, something that I, I came across recently, uh, the LSO did it uh, as on a stream, and I thought the conductor did it way too slowly. In fact, I thought the movement was never mm. going to end. I think sometimes there is a, it's a fine line, uh, and and it can and it People can drag it. if you if it, they milk it exactly. And of course, it's one of those solos mm. that you, in a way, you want the core anglais player to milk it because it's their big moment. But I, I'm not. I'm not sure. It's a bit like Nimrod. You know, people do Nimrod too slowly. It's not designed to be like that. It's not that kind of piece. Mm. And I. And and in a way, I feel that with with New World, it's too luxurious sometimes for people. Too lovely, and they, they just sort of settle mm. into it like a nice warm bath. When actually, I think it needs to be a little brighter than than that. To to because it's you know it's it's not like it's not a sad theme, is it? It's a. I, no. I, I always hear it as a beautiful sunny theme. And of course, I think people forget that you can achieve pastoral serenity with a fairly fast tempo as well. Mm. Um, it's one of the issues with Martinus' second violin concerto, actually. Mm. It's, it's not a slow movement. It's, uh, it's an andante moderato, I think. Mm. And some people will play it quite slow, but actually it's interesting how with a pretty fast tempo, you can achieve exactly that sort of serenity and flow. It's all about fluidity. Um, yeah. and flow I think uh, and that's what captures it yeah, and yeah. yeah you're absolutely right people can over milk the the core wrongly there <laughs> and again it often so comes down to who's playing it as well and yeah uh, I, think, I think we've all probably been subjected to some rather icky uh, amateur versions and some and also <laughs> some rather wonderful uh, amateur versions as well but uh, yeah uh, it's a great choice and definitely a bible and shakespeare uh, choice I was wondering whether just coming back to the to the french horn um, one of my choices uh, is, is Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony and the second slow movement horn theme. Um, and uh, I wonder whether that might be a sort of Bible and Shakespeare-y um, uh, inclusion. I mean, it is one of Tchaikovsky's great tunes from someone who wrote perhaps more great tunes than almost anyone else. Um, and it's just the most gorgeous sound, of course. It's the 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 register for the horn. It's perfect. It's it's as close, I suppose, to kind of singing that you can get from an instrument in that in that sense. And oh, I don't know what else can you say about that about that theme. I mean, it's incredibly famous, of course it is. But um, again, it's one of those. I think it's one of those. I think of all instruments, you know, everyone knows that the horn is an incredibly difficult instrument to play. A lot of audiences perhaps don't realize that but it's certainly true i think that ab above any other instrument if there's a big horn solo coming up the orchestra is sitting there thinking please please don't cock this up in, in a way that they perhaps wouldn't be with many other instruments <laughs> because the risk involved is so great with a horn player it would seem to me uh and they often get the you know the the shuffle of the feet from the other players, which is a, a musician's um, habit of, 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 of sort of subtly being able to say, well done after a solo. And I think that's particularly the case with horn players because it can often be such a big challenge. Richard, you wanted to come in on that? Well, well, yes, I mean, from I, mean, I can testify from my own horn playing days that that's, that's certainly the case. It's, it's absolutely um, um, 
you know, the instrument is so volatile. Um, the greatest horn player in the world can do everything right, and the instrument can still rebel. Um, it's it's almost a mind game. It's been compared, you know, it's, it's almost like you're playing a psychological game with yourself and with the instrument, trying to try and yes. will yourself to get it right. I say you do everything right, still goes wrong, still cracks, still splits. Suddenly, something, some teeny freak, uncontrolled element throws everything off. And um, I mean, I've, I've got a list of horn solos as long as my arm. I mean, I, yeah. um, I mean, we're saying you're saying about people choosing the in, the um, solos on their own instruments, and of course, you know, as we know, part of the culture of learning an instrument, especially an orchestral instrument, is you get given these books of the great solos that you'll need to learn. You'll have to have them prepared. If you're ever going to do an audition, you might find them sprung on you in an orchestra and every sort of, anyone who has any real aspiration to play seriously in an orchestra on pretty much any instrument has got these things at their fingertips or practices mm. away at them, constantly is waiting for their chance to do them or has them at least polished up to a standard they won't embarrass themselves. They find they suddenly have to play it. Um, I, I had about three books of these for horns. One of them was entirely <laughs> Wagner, I have to say. I know I'm not allowed to mention Wagner anymore, um, yeah. but um, there is, there is. I mean, I, 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 I went to hear a concert many, many years ago of extracts from um, you know, big, big Wagner bleeding chunks played by the Liverpool Philharmonic. I think Lee Peshek was conducting it back then, and they'd done the sequence Siegfried's Horn Call and Rhine Journey um, from Gesta Dämmerung. Um, and they, they'd done it fantastically. The horn player, the principal horn, had gone off stage to get the distance effect. Um, you know, you know Siegfried bounds off into a distance, and in the distance you just hear this fantastically spirited horn call that shows and captivates his character, um, and it goes on and on. It builds to a climax. It's a really sort of stirring call. And anyway, the poor chap, um, he, some, something went wrong. It could happen to anyone. It's actually no reflection on the player. He blew it. It just cracked all over the place. It was a catastrophe. And then, um, because of the way Liverpool Phil was structured at that time, the, the way the, way the the building was structured and what he then had to do was he had to open a door at the back of the stage right in the center of the platform in front of the entire orchestra he then had to walk down a massive flight of steps through the choir stores in full view of the entire audience while the orchestra was continuing to play everyone looking at him going down those steps <laughs> having just um and I, I i i still my heart still bleeds for that player. Um, it's just a horrible, horrible feeling. I mean, there's a reason why the horns are the only section of a whole orchestra that actually carry a, a spare player, a bumper, um, so that the principal can yeah. keep themselves fresh for the soloists. Yes. We went We went to see John Williams at the Hollywood Bowl one year, and um, the music for Jurassic Park starts with a lone horn, really hard um, part. I mean, let's be honest, it is hard. And I've heard it. Um, messed up so many times but <laughs> this this horn plan it was the um it was the la philharmonic and uh oh dear it, it went really wrong in front of you know seventeen thousand people uh and um it was a bit of a disaster and we were sort of sitting there looking at each other going oh no but what was what was funny was that in the second half he was nowhere to be seen and we we started sort of fantasizing about the idea he'd been taken backstage and shot you know uh, but um i think what really had happened was that they share the principles does <laughs> particularly in very demanding programs but it 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 just so happened that having messed up this massive solo he was then not seen again for the rest of the evening <laughs> oh dear <laughs> but as you say bumpers uh, are, are there uh, often for that but it's, it's an exposed solo there's no there really is nowhere nowhere to hide just to mention a couple of other uh, horn pieces that, that other people have mentioned uh, on social media david kent mentioned the horn solo in Mala 7, uh, Sarah G, the horn solo in Mala 5. Um, and uh, there's also um, a lot of mentions for the horn uh, solo in Chike 5, as, I, as I've been cho choosing. Um, ben Goldscheider suggested, um, I'm looking for it here now, Borodin 2, uh, the horn solo in Borodin 2, which is a piece that's been mentioned uh, on here a couple of times as well. So a lot Lots of love for the uh, for the French horn uh, in in here. Um, right, where are we, Richard? Another one from you. Well, this sort of takes off from the horn conversation. I mean, I can't believe that list you've just read of horn solos didn't mention anything by by the great horn composer, the Mister Horn himself in every sense, um, Richard Strauss? Strauss. Yes, no, they do. Um, the they do. I do. Horn. Um, to, to be fair, just, just ah, to be fair, okay. they they have mentioned them. It's just I happen to not mention them in that little bit there. Okay, I mean, I mean, I mean, you're not, you know, you've not you've not been backstage with an orchestra listening to tune up unless you've heard Till Oylenspiegel, the opening solo Absolutely. being sort of played somewhere <laughs> through the through the chaos. Um, 
and and yeah, I mean, I I started thinking about Richard Strauss's instrumental solos, and again, like like with Boleros, it, it, it'd always be top five instrumental solos in Don Juan alone. Mm. You know, the oboe, the violin, that amazing horn theme that comes through. Was, you know, um, but um, yeah, ranging across Strauss's output was just so much. I mean, I wanted to go with the cello in Don Quixote, um, of course, it's one of the family of solo instruments in that in that in that piece. And it's an incredible piece. It's effectively a sinfonia contrapante, really. I think so. Whether I mean, it's almost always these days played almost with a with with a with a brought in soloist, even though Strauss specified it should be played by the principal cello of the orchestra. Um, I mean, we couldn't include it in concertos because it's not technically a concerto. But I don't know where else we would include it if we didn't mention it here. Um, but there's also um, things like the violin solo in the four last songs. Um, you know, it's sort of supposed to, the, the soul flying free in the enchanted circles of night, and um, the violin embodying that sort of spirit being freed. And um, say so the oboe solo in, in in Don Juan I mentioned earlier. You know, this sort of love song, this sort of love theme, this sort of this simultaneously sort of passionate and very hesitant, very poignant, rather a surprise in this sweeping, ardent work um and you know the list goes on and on with strauss um i mean the biggie the one that we've probably got to talk about here is, is the violin in our heldenleben um isn't it really mm. um, there's so many great violin solos in the orchestral repertoire generally of a larger scale and a more greater ambition than almost any other instrument because it's assumed that the leader of the orchestra the, first, the principal violin the first violin um is effective can be a soloist is good enough and, and will be ready to step out and it's the most obvious you know, it's almost the most obvious solo that there can be. But the Heldenleben, of course, for those who don't know it, um, it's basically Strauss doing a musical portrait of his wife, Pauline, um, who was an extraordinary woman by all accounts, a professional singer um, in her early life, um, devoted wife, um, reputedly said to have an absolutely fearsome temper who would regularly sort of shout at and insult her husband, Richard, um, in public. Um, to which he would generally give a, a, a smile and just say, I think his famous line was, well, she's a bit rough with me, but it's what I need. Um, um, I remember fame, uh, uh, read, reading that um, at, the age, at the age of 85, apparently, uh, shortly before Strauss's death, um, she thought that um, a soprano, a young soprano who was working with him was sort of being a little bit too friendly. And she's just like, you go anywhere near my Richard and I'll scratch your eyes out. Um, she's a hell of a woman. <laughs> As anyone knows who's seen Intermezzo, the opera in which he sort of portrays her home life very, very, probably too accurately. Um, but this is a violin, this, this is a love scene from Ein Heldenleben, and it's it's his attempt to sort of capture her whole personality um, and his love for her in one extraordinary violin solo. The violin becomes Pauline. Um, you know, it's flirtatious, it's impetuous, it's skittish, it's unpredictable, it's also soaringly beautiful, radiant passionate, um, sexy, um, all those things. It's an absolutely huge part on, on a concerto scale. I mean, you know, it's one of those people, you can't just stick this thing in the programme. You have to sit down and agree with the leader well in advance that this is going to be coming up in six months' time because it, it is comparable to playing a violin concerto. It's a good sort of 15 or so solid minutes of virtuosic, highly characterful um, solo playing. And yet it's all within this greater sweep of music, this sort of musical character study, this big huge world that Strauss, um, Strauss creates. And um, I mean, there's no greater tribute you can pay to it than the fact that apparently um, Jilly Cooper, when she wrote her um, seminal classic of orchestral um, life and backstage bonking, um, Appassionata, said that she find, she got the idea of the two her two characters um, are a, a smoking hot lady violinist um, and a um, hunky horn player. Um, and she's inspired apparently by the final bars of Ein Heldenleben when the violin and the horn are just duetting together in this radiant love duet, this sort of tranquil ending of the piece. And apparently that's where she got the idea for her hero, Viking, uh, the horn player, and uh, her heroine, Abby, La Passionata, the, um, as I say, smoking hot and um, nonetheless um, highly sexy and talented violinist. Honestly, Richard, uh, I think that's quite enough sex. Uh, Charlotte, can you can you clean this up for us a little bit with a... With another choice? <laughs> well, kind of, I suppose. Um, Shostakovich has already been mentioned, so has on stage issues. Uh, as I'm going to combine those with my story about Shostakovich's chamber symphony in mm. C minor. Um, absolutely incredible work. Uh, dark trouble, very, very beautiful. It began life as string quartet number eight, 
composed in 1960. Shostakovich had gone to Dresden um, to write some film music. He didn't manage to write the film music. He instead wrote this, as he put it, a quartet that nobody has any use for. Um, one of the most powerful things that he wrote. Um, he said at the time it was um, inspired by walking around the ruins of Dresden and he wrote it to the memory of those who had died as a result of war and fascism. But there was clearly something else going on there as well, um, something autobiographical. Um, he was very depressed at the time. He got back from that trip, apparently with a bottle of sleeping pills and talking about committing suicide. And he had spoke about having, creating a obituary for himself because nobody else would. And this piece has the DSCH motto, motto woven in it over and over. Um, it's got multiple quotations from various works. Um, it's got the Diaziri funeral chant. It has echoes of Jewish folk. Um, Shostakovich himself described it as pseudo tragic. And so you had this extraordinary work, the string quartet. And then Rudolf Barshai came along, a um, former Borodin quartet member. He was in a trio with Rostropovich and Leonard Kogan and director of the Moscow Chamber Orchestra. And it was for the Moscow Chamber Orchestra that he wrote the arrangement, the chamber orchestra arrangement of this quartet. And obviously there's an extent to which if you translate anything into chamber orchestra, just the sheer, the extra weight that that brings is going to perhaps take the take it up a notch in terms of how it hits you. But I think what really does it is actually the various orchestral solos that he's put throughout this work, because there is something about a um, person being all alone, um, feeling completely got out by everybody, the solitary character and um, persecuted. And you get that in his various solos. Um, there's the concert master, there's the viola, cello. I think the cello one might be the most beautiful. I think it's in the third mm -hmm. movement. And we've just had um, echoes of the cello concerto number one. And then comes this keening cello solo right up in its upper registers, a quotation from Lady Macbeth of Minsk, which was the 1936 opera that had Stalin come down on him like a ton of bricks. And accompanying it are these kind of um, slithering, sinisterly slithering violin figures and it's so so powerful but I also know I, I associate this particular work with um, the most bizarre performance the most bizarre concert ever which I went to it seems like a million years ago now but it was actually only last last year um, in early summer in Andermatt in Switzerland this rather forgotten Swiss resort that they're now trying to resurrect and redevelop and as part of this, they built a concert hall there. And it's actually got rather a nice acoustic, but to kind of jolly everybody up and say you should come, it's, it's a great place. It's a wonderful cultural place to be. They invited the Berlin Philharmonic to come and play its opening concert. And so I came along with Theodor Karensis um, conducting and um, they had the Chamber Symphony. And now the playing was glorious. I mean, it was the typical Berlin fill. It was glossy, it was polished. My gosh, just that orchestra they play as a chamber unit so well which is what you really need particularly with all of these solos coming in from the orchestra but literally just before the concert master's first solo his string snapped mm. and the whole normally when a string snaps it should be really really fast you quickly if it's the concert master the desk they swap violins nobody stops you carried on and I don't know whether I think probably they were just so utterly bemused as to what they were doing there like a lot of us that they just went to pieces. The whole orchestra shuddered to a complete halt. And the concert master looked at Carensis and kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, what can you do? I'm sorry. And everyone just, so there was about three seconds when nothing happened. And then he looked at his desk partner and the desk partner looked back at him and there was clearly kind of, what, I'm gonna give me your violin. And eventually they did swap violins. And then came the drama as the solo started of, the desk partner and the desk behind trying to restring this wretched violin with a snap string. Um, and eventually a string got passed over from the desk behind. And this thing must have gone on for five minutes or so. Um, but where I'm getting to um, in this kind of string snapping disaster is despite literally a fiasco happening on the front two desks of the violins, this music just transcended it. Um, the concert master's solo, I mean, it was still beautiful. And every single thing about it, I mean, it was an, all, it was an audience where there weren't that many punters. There were probably a few punters, just normal people, but there were also lots of architectural journalists, 
very few classical music journalists. And everybody was just floored by it. Um, it was the most extraordinary thing. And at the end of the piece, even after all of that fandango earlier on, the silence, I wish, I so wish I had had a stopwatch because I'm not kidding you, it must have held for a good minute, maybe more of silence when this music stopped before anybody dared to clap. Um, it was that powerful. And I really think that it's the fact that it was this, this chamber arrangement for orchestra with all of these solos that did it. Well, I mean, it's very interesting you, you pick this, Charlotte, because I'm fairly certain, if memory serves, in podcasts before you came on board, Richard and I were in total agreement that we dislike the chamber symphony <laughs> version of, of the eighth <laughs> quartet. Because, I mean, you, you said no about... Way. you said. You said about it going up another level, it ratchets up, up the tension more. Mm. I think it's the exact opposite. I find the, I find the Chamber Symphony version, uh, it, it leaves me completely cold, weirdly. I mean, it's the same music, but it's, I, I don't need to hear mass strings play it. I think the, the brilliance of the eighth is in the detail. It's in the, it's in the cutting edge of the, of the way in which the, those instruments are, uh, the way he demands the playing of those instruments. It's the, the fact that it was written for a quartet that matters in that piece uh, and, and expanding it in that way, in that sound world, to me, doesn't work at all. It, it, it makes it far too lush and not biting enough to, to be. It's such a, in places, such a violent work. And I think it only works in its violence with individual players. But anyway, we, 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 we're not here to, to discuss that, but I think it's very interesting that you picked that. And I, I was wondering whether Richard was bursting yeah, to say the same thing, but anyway, <laughs> um, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm now going to stun Richard into possible silence because my next choice is Wagner and probably the great, I think, the greatest moment in all music, which is in Siegfried's funeral march in Goethe Demero, when uh, the trumpet comes in with its C major, notes from the C major chord, uh, in one of, I think, pro probably the greatest climax of any music ever written. And I think that works even if you only listen to the funeral march, let alone the hours and hours and hours of music that it's taken to get to that particular moment in the whole ring cycle. Um, again, I think it depends on who's playing it, but if you've got a wonderful trumpet player who can just rise above the whole thing, get over the top of the orchestra as it's building and building, uh, there really is no other moment like it. And it's the simplicity of it again. I mean, it's a payoff of course, because it's a theme that comes up throughout um, uh, the ring and uh, it, 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 it builds to that moment. But what a moment and to save it for, for the trumpet and a lone trumpet at that. I mean, I, I, I've, I've talked to trumpeters about this because the, the last note of the solo um, is, is a big crescendo. And having given your all in the previous few bars, you, you, really, you really have to have a lip to be able to do that crescendo some justice to really bring it out at the end of that crescendo. So it's really loud and comes over the top of the orchestra. And I think a lot of tr trumpet sections share that note in the, in the crescendo because it is such a big ask for a single player to play that whole section uh, so effectively. And uh, so often they will blend their sound, particularly on recordings, I think. So it sounds like one player, but is in fact an, a few others sort of coming in to, to, to take over to get louder and louder. Anyway, Richard, there you are. I've given you <laughs> a platform here, Wagner, but you, you will know precisely the, the moment I'm talking about. What you're saying, I mean, what you're saying there about, um, you know, the, the stamina required for the solo player. I mean, of course, at that point in that act of the opera, we've been playing, the orchestra's been playing continuously for about an hour and a half at that yes. stage. Prior to that has been playing for a previous three hours since the opera <laughs> started, even even with intervals. Yes. Even if you allow the intervals, um, but it, it is. But I'm Wagner, one of the great orchestrators, there's no getting around that. Um, I mean, the, the, you're referring, I think you're referring to, it, it, Wagnerians call it the sword motif. And it um, first appears in the Valkyrie. Um, yeah. And in almost a very similar form, the, the climax of Act One of the Valkyrie, when you've got these sort of doomed lovers, Siegmund and Sieglinde, um, facing s certain death, they think. And as if by a miracle, this sword is found plunged into the tree, which is going to save him. This sword has been sent by the gods to 
in the darkest moments of need to sort of give a hope of triumph of hope to create a new future and he pulls the sword out of the tree and at that point you hear that motif um, this sort of triumphant c major well i don't think it's a c major but anyway it's this sort of it's it's, it's it's built from the raw elements of music it's an arpeggio transmuted to a primal object gleaming on the trumpets for sword um, and at that moment it's like glorious moment of hope and love is and flushes a torrent of passion and hope and excitement in the opera all gets swept away by the end of Valkyrie and then here we are um, pretty much as we're approaching the final scene of the whole four-day epic at the climax of Siegfried's funeral march everything is ruined everything is about to fall in ashes the world is doomed at this point the hero is dead shamefully horribly killed all the hope has been betrayed and at that moment it's great climax that motif blazes through again the, you know the irony the sort of pain the sorrow and also the pride and the hope everything encapsulated in that motif I mean, this is what makes Wagner so great thinking on that scale I mean if you've if you've been there for the whole journey it's a payoff and of course it is it's a payoff encapsulated in in the music um in that that thrill that you've just described Tommy that you have that moment of excitement that moment of awe um which comes from you know a single shining trombone and um, trumpet motif rising out cutting out shut out gleaming above this darkening landscape um all its pride, all its glory. Um, and of course, you know, if you've been following the drama, that this is really going to be the end of everything. Um, it's and, quite wow. Well, it's yeah. quite something though, isn't it, for a composer yeah. to give a player the the moment, you know. I mean, but, the, but, the moment they've been building up. And and as a as a as a player, as an orchestral player, you're going to be sitting, you you know, all trumpet players, I'm sure, will play it in their re repertoire books. It's one of those one of those moments, isn't it? Not everyone will get to play yeah. it, of course. But um, and and of course, because because it's done as a concert work a lot, then uh, clearly they get a, a bigger chance of doing it than they might do in a uh, less so uh, in, in the actual opera. But to actually well, give a, a moment like that of, of such significance to one player, it's not even a section. It's, it's one player. It's quite it's something. daring, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's daring. It's mastery. You know, he's taking that risk, but he's assuming that at this point, everyone will be so on board with what he's doing, so swept mm -hmm. along, so absolutely at the top of their game um, that it's going to work. And again, that sense of danger, that sense of anxiety, perhaps, is, is sort of contributes to that, mm -hmm. gives it that thrill. I mean, I mean, I, I, I'm lucky enough to have um, known a lot of the players who were involved with the, the ring cycle that's being performed at Longborough Opera in the Cotswolds. This extraordinary little opera house has been built by a remarkable couple in an old chicken shed to put on a ring cycle, which they've done with a full orchestra. And the, the players have been assembled from across the Midlands. I know many of the players, um, a lot of them are freelancers. And of course, being freelance orchestral players working in the British regions, most of them have never had any cause to sit down and play a Wagner opera. Um, or necessarily listen to one and I first became aware that what's going on down at Long well, one by one I just kept meeting players who were chatting to me and saying this stuff this music it's incredible I've never played anything like this you know this is the best thing I've ever played I can't wait to do more of it um it, it pulls them in and it sweeps along he knows how to write and again it's that thing about finding the character of the instrument isn't it you know the, the trumpet heroic tragic also powerful stark solitary all those qualities in the instrument like with the horn again the way he uses the horn um i wanted to talk at one point about the bass clarinet solo in tristan and isolde which has mm -hmm. got to be one of the greatest woodwind solos of all time not to mention the cor anglais solo in the same opera um which again it's exactly that color and the personality of the instruments is tied up with the drama with the personality of the characters with the dramatic situation wagner had that remarkable ability like all the great opera composers to match that colour and that quality and all those, he brings in all those associations that we associate with the trumpet, all the mythic historic associations he's kind of recruiting and um, putting to work in the course of his storytelling. Okay, so uh, let's go to a, we on our last two choices now briefly. Richard, your next one. Um, the clarinet solo in the slow movement of Rachmaninoff's second symphony. Um, absolutely, I mean, what a long, glorious, ravishing melodies and how beautifully set up. I think the strings are in something like 16 parts underneath the tapestry of sound. Absolutely. Yeah. Exquisite. Rat Maninoff actually comes up a lot. Uh, uh, I, I, actually quite surprising. I, I don't know why on, on social media and uh, people mentioning about the symphonic dances, for example, the saxophone, uh, various other, other law, big long melodies that, that he gives, he gives instruments um, as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Charlotte. Viola. Um, the viola mm. in the slow movement of spring of Fabaldi's Four Seasons. 
I mean, it, it sort of it leave, it leaves the field wide, wide open for viola jokes, doesn't it? Um, Viola, <laughs> um, Vivaldi gives the dog part to the viola. Marvellous. Yes. Um, and it, it's almost sort of what kind of solo is it? It just goes uh, 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 over and over again for the entire movement. I mean, it's hardly glorious. Um, but I find this thing absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I think for the starters, it's just wonderful programmatic writing. Um, you've got this dog barking and then this floating goat herd sleeping over the top in a violin. Um, and I always find it fascinating hearing what orchestras do with it because some people, I was talking about Alexandra Kononova earlier, her viola is so out in the foreground. This is a bark right in front of you. And the violin is so far in the background, it's just a whisper. Sorry, the violin is so far in the background, it's a whisper. Other, and it has a very, the viola is very kind of peppery and bouncy, real woof happening as well. Whereas it can be far more subtle on other recordings. Um, it can be far more legato, um, far further down in the sound with the violin further over. So it's always a fascinating one for me. When you get to spring, what are they going to do with the viola? Mm. I nearly chose viola, the viola solo in, um, in the south, Elgar because it's this beautiful mm. kind of folky tune that, 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 he, that he brings in uh, in the middle there. Gorgeous little, little solo. Uh, that. It was another one that was chosen, by the way, by Michael Seal on, um, on Facebook, because uh, he, he chose, uh, also chose Ratmaninoff symphonic dances for the, sa the saxophone and in pictures at an exhibition as well, saxophone center in there. In fact, pictures at an exhibition comes up quite a bit inevitably, because uh, there are quite a few uh, big solo, orchestral solos in there. My next one is um, the, I mean, again, Mahler, uh, you, you know, you could choose loads from Shostakovich, you could choose loads from Mahler. I mean, horn solos we've already mentioned. And in fact, in Mahler three, the big theme at the beginning uh, which is um, played by the horn section. It's just so awesome. But then he brings it in with the trombone on its own. And I still think that's one of the great dramatic solos in all orchestral music. It's again, it's one of those huge moments for the player because everyone knows it's coming. Um, and it's so exposed as well. And also hard. Uh, it's, it's all over the place as far as its range is concerned and pitches. But I think for sheer excitement, um, especially as, as I mean, there aren't a huge number of trombone, major trombone solos out there in, in, in orchestral music, but that is certainly one of them, one of the greats, I think. And uh, I'm going to make, uh, I've made, I've surprised Richard once. I'm going to now bore him by saying that easily my favorite recording is Bernstein and the New York Philharmonic, uh, the later recording. I think the trombonist, whoever the trombonist is, on that, and, and actually, by the way, also the horn section, I still think one of the great horn sections in New York Philharmonic on, on that recording, but whoever the, the trombonist is on that, absolutely phenomenal playing. I mean, it, it's, it's extremely loud. It's hard though to play, I think, something so loud, but also with such great emotion and heart. And whoever it is, does it brilliantly uh, on that recording. So final choice then from you, Richard. Um, well, how about the, um bit at the end of the first movement of Elgar's first symphony uh, when he brings the theme back on the back desk of the first <laughs> back desk of the violins yes i can't remember it's the first or the seconds but let's hear it for the back desks of the violins <laughs> you know how often do they get a solo and how often does a composer understand the psychology of an orchestra and understand the sensitivities of orchestral players um, well enough to actually sort of use that use that, that their skill their, their ability their particular sound quality yes so, so effectively I mean, I mean, that's OK in professional orchestras, of course. Uh, it's, it's, it's less so in, for example, let's take an example. Youth orchestras do Elgar one a lot. And often, as is the way of things with youth orchestras, violinists work their way up the section, don't they? So the best ones are at the front and the inexperienced ones are at the back. And I would think if you suddenly, if you're like 12 and you're in a youth orchestra and suddenly you look at your part and you've got a solo, that's going to be pretty terrifying. Well, that was, I mean, that was when we, we ran a youth orchestra at the CBSO, we were very, very careful to avoid exactly that. I mean, there was a certain hierarchy with the violins of experience, quite a wide range of experience, but yeah, it was made very, very clear that every player had to pull their weight and was there for a reason. And yeah. we took care to actually put strong players throughout each section for exactly 
that that reason. But you're right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's possibly they're not expecting it, and it's not. Uh, so it might not perhaps be the treat or the moment to shine that perhaps Elgar hoped it would be. I mean, he's he's a violinist himself. That's the thing. He's an orchestral violinist. There was a wonderful, wonderful story um, about when he conducted the CBSO's first ever concert um, in Super Town Hall, Birmingham, in 19. 19- November 1920 and he, he he came on to conduct and he's talking to the orchestra about how he had um played in the orchestra at the Birmingham Triennial Festival 50 years previously um playing second violin and he said that when I came on to rehearse this afternoon there was only one seat empty in the orchestra and it was one I used to sit in so I almost expected to see myself come on with a fiddle <laughs> lovely all right Charlotte your final choice and were there any that got away my final well yeah there were in fact um I changed my final choice only this morning. Now, originally it was going to be the clarinet solo at the start of Rhapsody in Blue, mm. uh, which it, it's a phenomenal piece. And I think what I love about this is the irony that this piece for piano and jazz orchestra and strings, um, the most memorable part of it is the clarinet solo at the beginning. The clarinet utterly steals the show, doesn't it? It's, it's absolutely <laughs> magical. Well, when, and when, I love the story. When the player gets it, it right, anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is but it, I, I love the story behind the whole thing as well. The fact that um, Gershwin said no initially when he received the commission in November for this concert. It was Paul Whiteman, a band leader, who said, I, I want to have this experiment in modern music concert. I want you to write a piece for that molds, melds classical and jazz. And Gershwin said, no, no, not for a February concert when it's November, sorry. <laughs> and then somebody um, slipped to the New York Times in January the fact that Gershwin was writing a new piece for jazz orchestra. And, and so um, he had his arm twisted around his back and he had to write the piece in six weeks. And of course it was the piece that catapulted him to fame. But I didn't pick that in the end. I was instead, um, th- my thanks to Nigel Simeon this morning on Facebook oh, yes. for mentioning the viola part in the uh, slow movement of Ra- Vaughan Williams's London Symphony. Mm. Now to my shame, I didn't know what he was talking about. So I had to go and look it up. And my gosh, um, it's absolutely heavenly. Um, Vaughan Williams really knew how to work the viola. He knew that the real gold was to be found in its upper registers and boy did he milk it here. I was talking about his suite for viola and string orchestra a couple of weeks back and it's exactly the same here, that wonderful high register stuff. And what I particularly love about this solo is that it's a chain. So that viola, which comes heavenly singing, actually dovetails into a rising cello solo and then a clarinet solo because off the back of it. And it must be one of the most sublime, sublime links of orchestral solos I've ever heard. So my thanks to Nigel for that one. And if you don't know it, go and look it up because it's absolutely heavenly. Uh, you, you, you changed your mind this morning. I, I've actually changed mine during the show. Um, <laughs> I, was going to, uh, I was going to choose the um, E flat clarinet at the... Uh, at the beginning of the last last movement of uh, or the the last section of Symphony Fantastique Berlioz because it's again it's such a thrilling sound mm-hmm. and in in the right hand such fun yeah this sort of blah 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 blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's just and and it just sort of Im- immediately throws you into the madness of that of that final section and of course the the timpani uh, played quite a, quite a big uh, role in in Symphony Fantastique as well have a number of solos uh, where they are. Um, the storm uh, as well, uh, um, and that that's always great fun to play. Um, but I'm actually I'm going to pick one that actually is also uh, fabulous. It's, it's a it's a it's a timpani part, but it also means a lot to me as well, which is um, the timp's part timp part in Nielsen's Fourth Symphony, the Inextinguishable. Um, it's in the third section actually because it's it's actually a double timp part which has big solo at the end, the real climax of the of the work, where it's a dialogue really between the two two timpanists and it's incredibly exciting to play but actually the bit that i i enjoy playing more and it's it's a solo in the sense that it's the dominant um part really um underneath a uh, a big violin long violin line is in the um it's in the third section uh and uh, i mean it's it's a piece that's done all in, all in one really isn't it it's the third movement i suppose nominally in, in the symphony. Um, there's violins have this big long line and then the timpani and I think it's cellos and basses are pizzicato unison. But because of the, the nature of the timpani part, the cellos and basses, they all, all they have to do is pick a different note on the, 
on the fingerboard. The timpanist, it's a very chromatic part. So you are forever changing the note of every drum that you're playing. So we, we call it like a bicycle part because you're pedaling all the time. You're changing, it's really, it's, it can be really hard and it takes a lot of planning and choreography uh, to get it right uh, because you're almost playing a melody or you're playing a bass line uh, rather than just you know tonic and dominant as you so often do on, on the timps. We did it in the Kent Youth Orchestra and Michael Seal, who I, I've just I, I've been mentioning is a conductor, he was leading the orchestra at the time. And we essentially we were very good friends. We had this dialogue between the two of us. He was leading the violin uh, line. I was playing the timps uh, in it. And uh, I always remember it for that because we would look at each other while we were doing it across the sea of string players there. Um, and we did the performance um, on my 18th birthday. And so I remember it for that reason too, because obviously that was a very significant moment uh, for me. And we went back to my house that we had in London, which we just got because I was about to go to college and we had a big party. Um, so it seemed like the perfect tint part to do on one's 18th birthday. Uh, it's a tremendous part. And I should probably mention very quickly the um, Nielsen Five, which has a famous snare drum part where the instruction is to disrupt the orchestra. Uh, an instruction that all percussionists just dream of reading in a part and yet I never really quite hear it in performances there are every now and then I feel that the, the the snare drum player is really going for it but so many recordings out there I just don't feel the snare drum player is quite putting their back into it when it comes to actual disruption of the orchestra it's difficult um but uh yeah I mean that's a, that's a good one to mention I think it, it's got to be up there as well especially for, for for percussionists it's certainly a little bit more interesting uh than Bolero anyway as far where, where you're not disrupting but uh anyway that needs to go in there thank you very much um everybody for your choices and yeah thank you all uh, as well those of you listening for all your um, suggestions on Twitter and Facebook and again a, a, just an incredible range of pieces to pick through and to enjoy reading uh, uh, amazing please keep them coming in because we, we do love reading your suggestions whenever we put out these polls and uh, and ask you to suggest um, pieces for our top five so please, please keep keep doing it and I'll try and include as many as I can as we go along um, thank you very much as always to Charlotte and to Richard and our lovely producer, Simon Funnel. Um, we'll be back next week, but thank you very much, all of you, for listening. See you then. Bye-bye.